Good morning, welcome to CMC Markets on Friday the 4th of December. Um, joining me, Michael Hewson, to preview, look ahead to the week ahead beginning the 7th of December. Coming off the back of yet another fairly positive week for global equity markets, we've seen the Nikkei 225 once again push closer to 29 30-year highs, highest levels since 1991. We've seen US markets continue to push higher to new record highs and while European markets have lagged a little bit um, we have seen the FTSE 100 start to play a little bit of catch up on its losses so far this year don't get me wrong FTSE 100 is still um, significantly down from the levels that we saw at the beginning of the year around about 15 percent but it does appear to be playing catch up and a large part of that I think is down to the fact that we've got some optimism, rising optimism that despite all the um, political toing and froing between the European Union and the UK, we will get some form of Brexit deal, um, despite French threats to veto anything that they're not happy with. Um, we've also got the vaccine rollout, uh, the Pfizer vaccine rollout, which was given the go ahead by the UK government this week, which was perceived and received in a very positive light because it suggests that there is now finally a timeline for an end to these restrictions that have been really acting as a stranglehold on global economic activity. Doesn't resolve the immediate problem, however. The immediate problem of further restrictions being rolled out across Europe, extended into next year in France and Germany. Certainly the restrictions that England is now under are much more onerous than the ones that came that were that were in place pre November the 5th when the initial lockdown came in place but ultimately what we have seen in recent PMI numbers is that the UK PMIs in construction and manufacturing have been fairly resilient and even the services ones which you would have expected to have been disappointing weren't anywhere near as disappointing as those coming out of France Italy and Spain so there is grounds for optimism furthermore the latest Chinese economic data that we've been seeing coming out of the Middle Kingdom has actually been fairly positive. There is no sign of a second wave there. And as such, there is an awful lot more optimism about the Chinese and the Asian economic recovery, um, certainly in terms of being ahead of the game with respect to where Europe currently is. So um, markets are focusing on that. They're also focusing on the prospect of a new or a, a revived, if you like, US stimulus deal. Certainly, I think the recent um, jump in weekly jobless claims that we saw throughout November, I think has prompted a little bit of food for thought on the part of US policymakers that they need to get some form of stimulus deal in place to replace the one that rolls off at the end of this year. In the absence of any new deal, and this is important, and I think this is concentrating minds on Capitol Hill, in the absence of any new deal, um, 12 million Americans will lose their unemployment benefits as of the end of this year, as of the 31st of December. So they need to get some form of replacement in place, um, agreed by the 10th or 11th of December, by the end of this, well, by the end of next week, by the end of the upcoming week. As does the EU summit, which is also due on the 10th of, 10th of December, there needs to be some form of EU-UK trade deal outlined in place in time for that summit on Thursday. So we've got a couple of deadlines coming up in the course of the next week or so, which are likely to be key in terms of maintaining this move higher as we head towards the Christmas break. And yes, I've said it, I've said the C word, Christmas, because we're heading into Christmas now, and we're likely to see volatility increase and liquidity dry up. And the reason for that is because an awful lot of investors will start to retreat to the sidelines, particularly with markets approaching um, record highs in the US and multi-month highs here in the UK and Europe. Money will start to come off the table. People will retreat to the sidelines and volatility could well increase on the back of significantly increased headline risk. So we do need to be aware of that. We're well aware, we're well attuned to headline risk. Brexit, we've had it for the last three years, three to four years. 
So that will be nothing new. The difference will be that a drying up of liquidity will exacerbate any moves, not only in equity markets, but in currency markets as well, where we've seen a significant decline in the value of the dollar. We've broken below those previous, um, previous lows that I highlighted in my video last week, and that suggests we're going to see further dollar weakness going forward, which, which neatly segues me into one of the key, um, one of the key macro um, items that I'm looking out for in the upcoming week. It's the ECB rate meeting. Yes, we do have other rate meetings coming up in December, notably the Fed and the Bank of England, but they are the week after next. The primary focus now is on the ECB. And the reason for that is the rise in the euro through the 120 level. You can already see on my screen how that we've moved above 120 when our trading at 121.70. The likelihood is we're probably going to trade higher than that. If we look at the CMC dollar index, we've broken lower. And that suggests to me that there's potentially further downside. The reason there's potentially further downside is the equity markets tend to appear to be um, the only game in town. There's only really positive news out there. So I think there is potential um, as we look forward to next week's ECB meeting that we could actually see an open, we could see a 12 month extension to the bond buying program that's currently in place right now. Now, the ECB, as a reminder, extended the size or expanded the size of its pandemic emergency program, PEP, from 750 billion euros to 1.35 trillion euros, and they extended it into the middle of next year, 2021, June 2021. They could well extend that by six or 12 months um, when they meet next week. There is limited appetite for further cuts into negative territory. We're already well into negative territory on the part of the ECB. And the, the evidence is mixed in terms of how valuable further cuts into negative territory will be, notwithstanding the deleterious effect it has on European banks' balance sheets. So let's look at the euro dollar. We've broken above 120. On the basis of this analysis, Whatever the ECB does next week, it's not going to stop euro moving towards 125. Why do I say that? Because this 12070 area was a significant barrier. We've gone through that. We've broken through this triangular consolidation here. The, the minimum price objective for that is 122.30. Behind that, we've got the previous peaks from February 2018 of 124. The likelihood is we're going to revisit those. There's nothing the ECB can do to stop it. It is going to happen. So what does that mean for the dollar going forward? Well, essentially, it just means further dollar losses. Um, the Federal Reserve will always outswing, out punch, out whatever you want to say, the ECB or any other central bank for that matter. You can't avoid it. It is what it is. Um, and certainly the Fed certainly got more room to ease monetary policy than the ECB does. So um, that suggests that we could well see further dollar downside. If we're going to see further dollar downside, we should see further equity market upside, which is why I'm more constructive on equity markets than I was, say, for example, two or three weeks ago. We've seen a significant change in tone and in sentiment. And whatever you think of the fundamentals, the fundamentals in the short term are still pretty poor. We still have to get through the winter months. We still have to get through the increased infection rates. We still have to get through the rising, um, the rising death rates and the rising hospitalizations. But there is evidence starting to become manifest, starting to manifest itself that as we head into the spring, the outlook could well look an awful lot better as the vaccine gets rolled out. Not only here in the UK, where it's starting, potentially starting next week. But when it gets signed off by the EU at the end of this month and potentially the US even before that. And that's before you even consider the Oxford and AstraZeneca vaccine, which is undergoing further trials to better understand its efficacy. So um, for next week, at the moment, the outlook looks fairly positive for further euro dollar gains as it does for further 
equity market gains. We've broken above 6,500 in the FTSE 100. We still got some way to go before we go back to the levels that we saw at the beginning of the year. But nonetheless, this significant breakthrough 6,500, if sustained, could see us go all the way back to 6,600, potentially 7,000 over the course of the next few days and weeks. It's a very positive development. German DAX, on the other hand, is continuing to struggle below these peaks here. Now, why is the DAX struggling? Um, you may ask me. And the thing about that is, is that it has managed to retrace most of its losses for this year. So there is an element of the FTSE 100 playing catch up to the rebound that we've already seen in the DAX. So that is still capped in and around 13,460 finding a fairly decent area of support around about 13,200 doesn't change the fact that we're very much in a buy the dip mentality when it comes to the DAX but ultimately the data that we're seeing out of Europe is slightly worse than the data we're seeing out of the UK if you look at the PMIs that we've seen over the course of the past month or so Germany's PMIs on the manufacturing side have been fairly positive services have been weak France Italy and Spain again very weak and the fact of the matter is the European Union the EU still haven't signed off their EU recovery fund because of potential vetoes from Poland and Hungary so that's delaying a fiscal response on the part of the European Union and I think that is to a certain extent holding back any further gains in broader European equity markets because of the the reaction function of the European Union it's being constrained because they're going to have to they're having to get agreement from 26 27 other people hence why the UK was able to steal a march on the European Union in approving the sign off and rollout of the Pfizer vaccine all they needed was a sign off from their own medical regulator rather than another 27 and that was something that was outlined by the G German economy minister Jens Spahn where he said that they were prepared to wait for um, EU-wide approval, other member countries' approvals before signing it off, which to, to my mind seems mad when you've got a public health emergency. You do what's best for your population uh, and not what's politically ideological, what is ideologically pure, but this is where we are. So potentially more people could die because the EU have decided to delay the ratification of the vaccine rollout. Um, so that's the DAX. Um, looking at the S&P 500, still continues to go from strength to strength. 3,700, 3,800 now remains the next likely target for that. In terms of this breakout here, we could potentially even go as high as 4,000 over the course of the next three months. That's certainly my target in terms of the next three months for the S&P a break higher towards that 4,000 level going forward. So that's the FTSE 100, that's the S&P 500, that is the DAX. About the outlook for sterling, the outlook for sterling looks slightly more mixed. We have got some economic data out next week, UK industrial and manufacturing production for October. Um, that's still likely to look fairly positive um, over the course of the next few months simply because there's there's been an awful lot of what I would call catch up after the really sharp downturn that we saw in the April numbers. Recent PMI numbers have been fairly positive. These are industrial production numbers are due out on the 10th of December. They're likely to be fairly still fairly positive. Q3 was an especially positive quarter. Q4 is probably likely to be less so because of the the November shutdowns, but let's not forget the November shutdowns only really have affected the services sector. They haven't really affected manufacturing, industrial production or construction. Those have continued to tick along quite nicely. Nonetheless, cable still looks very much by the dip. There still appears to be a perception that we will get some form of skinny deal between now um, and the end of the month with the likelihood of it could be agreed within the next few days. It could well be that by the time that you hear this video, there could be something already agreed, which means that this video is slightly dated. Nonetheless, um, the, 
the uptrend still remains intact. And I think while we're above the series of lows through here, 27th of November, around about 132.80, then the line of least resistance for is, is for a continued move towards the upside. So very much still buy the dip mode on the back of a weaker dollar. I think the bigger concern is with respect to euro sterling. There the picture is slightly more mixed. We've seen a break above this trend line here, gapped higher. We haven't been able to break above a series of peaks through here, around about 9070. So I think that's the next key resistance there. It could just be another false break in euro sterling, but we need to break back below 90. I think that's really the key level for me. If we zoom right in here, ladies and gentlemen, you look at these series of three peaks here in these daily candles. Bit of a barrier there, bit of a support there. So for me, we need to get back below 90 to retarget the 8860 lows that I was talking about in my video last week. So we've broken higher. We haven't really broken through 9070. Until we do, there is a risk that this could be a false break and we could head back towards these lows over the course of the next few days. Time will tell. But certainly the euro sterling break higher doesn't look particularly conclusive at this moment in time, if we, unless we break above 9070, then of course I'll need to revisit my analysis on that basis. Um, so, so, so what else? Have, so, what else have we got? So, what have we? What else have we got to look forward to over the course of the next few days? We also got China trade. Now, China trade numbers. The Chinese economy has continued to look fairly positive. They're not. They're not um, suffering from a second wave. The most recent China trade numbers for October continued the chain of improvement that we saw in September when imports surged to their best levels this year. They did slow a little in October to 4.7%, which is a little bit disappointing. But ultimately, I think what the most recent retail sales numbers have shown us with respect to the Chinese economy is the Chinese consumer is starting to become more confident in the economic outlook. The lack of a second wave, the fact that they've managed to keep coronavirus cases fairly low as we head into the winter, suggests that the Chinese economy is likely to continue to improve through November. Um, and it's also, let's not also forget that the first part of November was Golden Week in China, and then we also had Singles Day as well. So domestic consumption should continue to improve throughout November, and the Chinese trade numbers should reflect that when they come out on Monday. So on Thursday, we've got an ECB rate meeting along with an EU summit. So hopefully there will be an EU summit which will sign off a bare bones, some form of EU-UK trade deal, always assuming that France doesn't veto it. At the moment, they're making an awful lot of noise about vetoing it. But if they do veto a trade deal, then French fishermen will lose their right to fish in UK waters as of the 1st of January, because ultimately that's when all existing treaties lapse. So in essence, they would, be, they would be shooting themselves in the foot if they were to do that. Um, we've also got a Bank of Canada rate meeting coming up on the 9th of December. Now, depending on today's payrolls report, Canada payrolls reports, that could well um, be significant. It's, it's unlikely that the Bank of Canada will cut rates further and act any more than they already um, than they are already doing with respect to them, their current asset purchase program. We also obviously have US payrolls data, which as of yet, I don't know the numbers for because I'm recording this pre-payrolls. Pre but ultimately, I think they're of less importance than the current US stimulus talks, which are currently taking place in Washington right now. The mood music does appear to be slightly more positive there. There does need to be some form of new deal and as a result, irrespective of how these payrolls report, how today's payrolls report comes out, I think the main focus will be on the stimulus talks and less on the actual payrolls numbers, which by and large have been fairly positive and where the unemployment rate is expected to fall further from 6.9% to 6.8%. So certainly in terms of euro sterling, sterling and the dollar, 
expecting further dollar downside, uh, further sterling and euro upside in the short to medium term. Gold prices continue to um, recover from the lows that we saw earlier this week. We need to get back through 1845, 1850 in the short to medium term to reinstate the move back higher. Certainly this, this, this candle pattern here looks constructive for a move back through 1845, back towards this trend line here, back towards 1900. That certainly looks like a morning star candlestick formation, which generally is positive and would be positive on a break back above this 1845, 1848 level here, which was resistance on, uh, which was support on the move lower and is now acting as resistance on any rebound. Brent crude prices are heading back up and could well retest the 5065 area, which is a 61.8 Fibonacci retracement level of this entire down move from this year's highs to this year's lows. So going to be a bit of a barrier, 50, 50 and a half, 50, 65 dollars, 50.65 dollars a barrel on Brent. Keep an eye on that for any pullback on Brent crude prices. In terms of what I'm looking forward, looking ahead to in terms of company news, it's a big week for Rolls-Royce. They've got their latest third quarter numbers coming out on Friday. Um, they've taken an absolute caning over the course of the past um, few weeks, few months, but hopefully the worst is behind them. They've raised more money. They've done a rights issue at 35p a share. Share price is now around about 131. Um, the reopening of the global economy hopefully will augur better times for Rolls-Royce, but we need to take out this series of peaks through here. At the moment, we're currently capped in and around um, this, this, this sort of area around here, around about 137, 138. Obviously, Ryanair buying 75 Boeing 737 Max is, is a statement of intent. But Michael O'Leary thinks that the outlook for air travel will be much more positive in 2021 than it has been this year. To be fair, it would be hard to be any worse. But to buy 75 Boeing 737 Max is, I think that's optimism plus, you know, that's optimism unlimited. I'm not sure I'd want to get on a Max even now. Um, nonetheless, it's a statement of intent. And if that continues into 2021, then hopefully Rolls-Royce share price, the worst is behind it. We've also got Airbnb's latest IPO. That, well, sort of latest IPO, the IPO for Air, Airbnb. That's due to price on the 9th to start trading on the 10th. I have done an article, a little bit of a preview on that, which you can find on the news and analysis section of the CMC Markets website. So certainly keep an eye on that, pricing that on the 10th. That's being priced at around about a valuation of $35 billion, between $40 and $55 a share. So keep an eye on that. We will be looking to launch that as and when it starts pricing on the 10th of December. And we've also got Ocado, it's the latest Q4 numbers. And they've been one of the one of the one of the big winners from the pandemic. But there is some very key support coming in on the Ocado share price at the moment. And you've got to think if there is going to be a reopening and less people shop online, Ocado could actually start to see a little bit of a money drifting out of it going forward. It's been a decent year for Ocado. If you select it year to date, we've seen, we've seen some really solid gains. But since September, it's been trending lower. And if we take out this trend line here, uh, which currently comes in just below 2,200, we could uh, well see a, a retest of the £20 level going forward. So um, that's what I'm keeping an eye out for um, in the upcoming week. Um, this will be the, this is going to be my penultimate video for this year. So I will probably finish up next Friday with my last full year look at the week ahead. Um, when I'll obviously be previewing the Federal Reserve and the Bank of England. Um, but if you do have any questions on any of this, feel free to drop me a line. 
um, or contact me on Twitter. You know where to find me. Otherwise, thank you very much for listening. This is Michael Houston talking to you from CMC Markets.